We come now to lesson nine in our exploration of Second Peter, end time enemies along the path are returning to corruption, and we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 22. And it's been said by uh, one commentator, at least, that this is the most neglected paragraph in what might be the most neglected letter in the New Testament, namely 2 Peter. And yet, uh, it's a very significant uh, paragraph as if you look at the text before us, it transitions us from uh, the description of the false teachers to Peter's discussion of the day of the Lord and, and, refer <clears throat> and refuting uh, the content of their false teaching as he's going to take up. And so it actually provides us with a kind of hinge uh, between chapter 2 and leading into chapter 3. And so hopefully uh, we can draw out some significant uh, points for us as Peter continues uh, his description of these uh, false teachers. He says there in verse 17, These are waterless springs, again referring back to the false teachers, uh, that he's been defining as those who are following the way of Balaam, uh, living in uh, accordance with the spirit of Balaam, desiring money and desiring sex. He says, These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions, of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way, the path of righteousness, then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. And so, uh, the main statement that Peter uh, is getting at here regarding the false teachers comes in verse 17, where he describes them as waterless springs and mists driven by the wind, waterless springs, and then also mists uh, driven by the wind. And he says that, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss why he refers to them as such, uh, but he continues his description of these false teachers uh, using, again, a kind of depersonalized terms, uh, describing them as inanimate objects of waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. And he says on the basis of that, on the basis of who they are, these are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm, he says on the basis of that, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Now, this language, the gloom of utter darkness, is throughout the Old Testament in terms of God's judgment. And so darkness is often associated with that. Think about the darkness on the day of the Lord, and even the darkness, as we're going to see, uh, that descends upon uh, the earth when Christ himself is crucified on the cross, uh, there being judged on behalf of his people, that they might be saved. And so the gloom of utter darkness begins to associate them with their destiny, of the judgment of the Lord, again reminding us that such are doomed. It also connects it back to the angels who had sinned in chapter 2 verse 4, where it says that if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to, ch to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until uh, the judgment. Their destiny is that of the angels whom have uh, fallen. And so Peter uh, describes these false teachers as waterless sp springs misdriven by a storm and how on the basis of that, the gloom of utter darkness has been uh, reserved uh, for them. He goes on, and we'll go back to this verse in a moment, but then he goes on to give various reasons um, that ground this claim that the gloom of utter darkness has been uh, reserved for them. 
And you see this in, in terms of his use of the word for as a connector. For, for example, in verse 18, for speaking loud boasts of folly. Or also in the end of verse 19, for whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world. Also the end of uh, verse 20, or 21a, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness and so on. So uh, Peter now, is everything is going to be drawing back to verse uh, 17. And so why does Peter, as we will, and we'll work our way through that, but before that, why does Peter uh, refer to the false teachers as waterless springs and mists driven by a storm? And part of it, if, I mean, the imagery is kind of clear and we can understand it in and of itself, right? Um, a spring is, of course, something you expect to go to, to be nourished by. And it's often used of the Lord in the Old Testament, how uh, these people would be um, hewing out cisterns for themselves that can hold no water. Meanwhile, they are forsaking uh, the Lord, who is uh, their, their, the spring of life and uh, the one from whom they receive all of their nourishment and sustenance. And so imagine being in a desert and imagine finding a spring and thinking that from it I'm going to receive nourishment and life. Instead, they are waterless springs. They're empty, they're dusty, and provide no sense of nourishment or life. Rather, what they promise, while they may have the appearance of a spring, and from, from afar right, you look upon them and say, well, here is a place where I might find refreshment for my soul, refreshment for my life. Here's where I might find all I need for life and godliness, right? But instead, as the false teachers, as people go after the false teachers, they ultimately find them to be who they are, waterless springs. And this is what Paul talk, uh, Peter talks about, especially in verse 19. They promise them freedom, right? They have all this, this the promises, but they cannot make good and satisfy those promises and fulfill them. But they themselves are slaves of corruption. And so while they promise them freedom, what they un end up offering is the very opposite. And so uh, the Apostle Peter is reminding us of their nature as waterless springs, as well as the same as, as um, windstorm-driven mist or mist driven by a storm. Uh, again, the imagery is uh, quite um, obvious, right? A storm, the, the mist as it might provide um, um, refreshment to the land around it, instead is simply just driven away, um, leaving that which it was occupying dry and uh, wasted. And the same thing is, uh, so the same idea is taking place uh, or is, is conveyed through calling them both waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. Where you might think water is going to be found, um, it is, it dissipates, it's gone, and they cannot provide uh, what they ultimately promise. Now, of course, Peter describes them as such, waterless springs, mist driven by, a, by the wind, um, in order to contrast what they are promising with what, of course, Christ has promised, right? If, if the false teachers are waterless springs and their promises can, they cannot make good on their promises, Peter all the more wants us then to recognize that while Christ promises more and greater things, even an eternal kingdom that transcends the present order of, real, of, of things here, that Christ is not a waterless spring. His apostles are not waterless springs, but they are springs full of living water instead. And I think this is one of the reasons why Peter especially has a very high Christology throughout this letter. We spoke about earlier how he refers to Christ as Lord in his exalted state. And even as we saw in chapter 1 in the opening uh, salutation, how he refers uh, to, to Jesus as God and speaks of his divine power and his divine nature. Um, all of these things is meant to highlight the fact that what Christ has promised, he can make good on, unlike those uh, false teachers who are unable uh, to do so, who are waterless springs. And therefore, those who follow after the false teachers follow also um, in their ultimate destruction, um, in the gloomy darkness, uh, the eschatological judgment that awaits them 
those who follow those false teachers while um, experiencing, at least in part, uh, the pleasures that they offer, but pleasures that, that are only belong to this world and know nothing of the eternal kingdom. And, um, and in contrast to that, those then who believe the promise um, that the apostles witnessed to um, have before them, not gloomy darkness, but rather an eternal kingdom. Again, the contrasts here are stark throughout Second Peter. And we see this, again, even one more kind of supporting argument for this. Uh, this contrast here is, again, the language of, of the path that he's been talking about in chapter 2. And how drawing from the Proverbs and simply just in kind of an Old Testament way of, of describing uh, the way that the two ways of living, right? Either you follow the path of righteousness or that of unrighteousness. Uh, Peter is highlighting again the fact that this path, the path of the false teachers, again, leads to that eschatological judgment, whereas this path, the path that is witnessed to by the apostle, uh, leads ultimately to the eternal kingdom, the eschatological salvation that is found uh, there. And so we can continue on uh, to consider um, what, uh, how he develops this further um, in the following verses. Verse 18 <clears throat> says there that for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Now, much debate, and it's kind of inconclusive, at least, what exactly Peter is, is getting at when he describes them as barely escaping from those who live in error. Um, the idea of escape was already used earlier in chapter 1, and verse 4, when he spoke of those um, through the promises having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful uh, desire. Uh, maybe speaking of those who, are, who may be enticed or are being lured in by the false teachers, um, as he's describing them here, as those who received these promises and have begun on this path, uh, but who are now potentially uh, being lured in by the path of the false teachers instead. And Peter uh, is saying that they do so by appealing to and enticing them by the passions of the flesh, right? Just as they themselves are have their eyes full of adultery, they themselves are defined by uh, the world in terms of its sinful desire, as chapter 1 verse 4 says. Uh, so here they begin to entice by putting them before them like, uh, before these people like bait, uh, desiring to entice them as a fisherman might uh, a fish uh, in the water by, by baiting his line. And so this continues to be the appeal of the false teachers. They speak loud boasts of folly and entice by passions of the flesh, that which belongs to the world with its sinful desire. He goes on to say, verse 19, they promise them freedom, as we mentioned earlier, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. They cannot, of course, give more than uh, and anything different than who they are, right? What they promise uh, flows out of, and what they ultimately give flows out of who they ultimately are as slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person to that, he is enslaved. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. And so again, what Peter is speaking of here is from, in a sense, a human perspective as those who received the gospel, those who had received the good news, those who had received the promise, right? They had uh, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And notice how Peter distinguishes uh, their knowledge, not of our Lord in terms of the, Jesus being both the Lord and Savior of the false teachers and the apostles uh, and the church, but rather distinguishes the false teachers from having Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And yet they knew of it, they had knowledge of that, they've received that word, um, but they returned back from what they had, um, through that word, escaped. Again, drawing from the language in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it's through those promises, if you remember, that we escape the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And so they made a beginning down the path, 
at least their life began to look as such, but they returned to what they truly were. And in that sense, they had never experienced the true saving work of verse 3 through 4, but made a showing of having done so. They began down the path, but they forsook that right path. Their hand was on the plow, but they have removed it and have turned back. Again, the same idea we've mentioned earlier, seen in Jesus' parable of the the sower and the seeds, right? As some seeds are planted in good soil and they produce good fruit and they grow and they continue and they abide. But other seed seed planted on rocky ground, right? It, It springs up for a time, but then it dissipates and the cares and the pleasures of the world end up uh, removing it. And so again, Peter is not speaking from the secret counsel of the Lord, uh, um, bringing into question and, and desiring that the church begin to question uh, their salvation and their, and their assurance. Rather, he said earlier, to make their calling and election sure and to confirm it. But rather, he is making the point that there are those, such teachers who may have begun down the path, but they have forsaken it uh, for the way of Balaam. And he says, furthermore, that such people, again entangled in such things and are overcome by them, he says, the last state at the end of verse 20 has become worse for them than uh, the first. And this principle, again, is drawn from Jesus' teaching uh, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus says, Verse 43, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first so also will it be with this evil uh, generation. And so Peter uh, is applying that very same principle uh, to such people who have received the knowledge of this path of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, have known it, even confessed it maybe at a point, uh, but now have forsaken it, deliberately forsaking it, not just from an ignorance of never having heard it, but having now forsaken it, it says that they're present situation, they're returning back to uh, the world, as uh, it's described in 1.4, returning back to here um, is uh, worse off than they were uh, before, being more um, um, grounded and even uh, digging their feet deeper uh, into their own error. He goes on to say verse 21, For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of of righteousness, which is what we were talking about, the path, right? The same word here, the way of righteousness, the path of righteousness. It would have have been better if they had never have known that than after having known it, turning back from the holy commandment delivered to them. That holy, the the phrase, the holy commandment delivered to them, um, likely, uh, anticipates what the Apostle is going to say in chapter 3, verse 2, encouraging the church in light of the false teachers and the reality of them, that you should remember the predictions of the holy uh, prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. And so it is the apostolic message um, that they are, that they have turned from and it would have been better if they had never known it, um, as their judgment will be all the more severe when Christ Uh, comes again. He he underscores this very point uh, by appealing to two Proverbs, uh, one from the Old Testament itself and and the other um, as uh, likely a common proverb of Peter's day, Um, though the language of both the dog and the sow, the dog and the pig, um, was common uh, animals that were appealed to as uh, unclean animals. Uh, Jesus will make mention of them also in his Sermon on the Mount, for example. But he gives these two proverbs uh, to underscore uh, the reality that he's been explaining in terms of uh, these false teachers 
um, being destined for the gloom of utter darkness on account of who they are as waterless springs and mist driven by the wind. And so he says in verse 22, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to wallow in uh, the mire. And so these uh, two proverbs, again, underscore what Peter is talking about. And as uh, one commentator had put it, that one's behavior and destiny determining identity will eventually surface. Will eventually surface. Uh, their, their fruit will eventually betray them. Goes, uh, the commentator goes on to say, dogs and pigs inevitably act as dogs and pigs in returning to the filth they have left behind. Both illustrate the character of the fool. Think about the Old Testament, the Proverbs. And then he concludes by saying, their actions inevitably, actually not conclude, I'm going to continue reading here, but their actions inevitably reveal their identity. There is a golden chain between identity, behavior, and destiny. Behavior is evidence flowing from one's identity and leading to one's destiny, as we saw positively in 3 through 11, right? The change of identity leads to a new destiny, also new behavior. Here we see it in the negative in terms of the false uh, teachers. The false teachers are not just any animals, but these animals are two most emblematically unclean animals for first century Jews who act in accordance with their nature. By contrast, Peter's point is that the beloved, as a result of God's gracious transforming power, will also inevitably act according to their identity, thereby being found spotless and blameless on the day of God. So as a point of summary, one's true identity and its consequences always win out in the eschatological end. Who somebody truly is will win out in the eschatological end. And so the false teachers betray themselves and ultimately can give nothing more than out of who they are, waterless springs misdriven by the wind. But those who, again, follow the promise here and receive that promise given from Christ through his apostles uh, find him to be not an empty spring, but a spring full of living water uh, from which they can drink um, to their satisfaction in this life and also for the world to come. It's his divine power, the divine power of Christ, that has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It is a full spring that Christ is for us in accordance with his divine power that guarantees it for us as well. And so now this is going to set up as he uh, ultimately now brings before us the destiny of the false teachers and those who follow them. Um, it sets up now the discussion of the day of the Lord, uh, as we're going to see in our next lesson. The day when the books are opened, uh, the day when while it may seem as if God is delayed, uh, God's judgment will finally be enacted. And as we've seen in previous lessons, it's the day when people's eschatological error by attributing eternity not to the kingdom but to the present age and the current order of things will be exposed and will be shown to have been false. It's on that day uh, that what they have been destined for will ultimately uh, they will ultimately be brought into, even as the people of God on that same day of judgment will also be saved and have entrance into the eternal kingdom. And so we'll take that up in our next lesson.